Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Dale Hall, and I am an electric vehicle researcher at the International Council on Clean Transportation, or ICCT. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's webinar from wherever you are calling in from, whatever time it is in your part of the world. Um, while the last few people are joining, I'll just very quickly give a few housekeeping notes. Um, as I'm sure many people will ask, this webinar is being recorded and we will send out the recording as well as the slides to all the participants and everyone who registered to the, for the webinar sometime next week. Uh, everyone has their microphones on mute just to prevent distractions. But uh, if you have questions, and we hope that you do, please write them in the questions box, uh, which is in the control panel on the right side of your screen. And our presenters can each answer quick cl clarification questions after their presentation, and we'll have more time for some open Q&A and discussion uh, toward the end of our 75-minute session today. So that leads me to our agenda for today on the next slide. And once I get out of your way, my colleague Alex Tanku from the ICCT will present on the findings from our recent CEV Alliance report on the used ZEV market. After that, Rachel Sakata, the program manage manager and senior air quality planner at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality will present some brand new findings from Oregon's clean vehicle rebate program. Next, we are very excited to have Scott Case, the CEO of Recurrent, who will share their company's unique insights on EV batteries from studying 7,000 EVs and what that means for the used electric vehicle market. And then finally, we are also very happy to have Asir Khalid, the director of EVA England, an association of electric vehicle drivers, who will share the challenges facing the used electric vehicle market in England and recommendations on how to improve uh, the situation there. And as I mentioned, uh, please uh, put your questions in the chat box, or sorry, the question box at any time, and we will get to them throughout and at the end of our 75 minutes together uh, and have Q&A at the end. But very quickly, before we get into the content, uh, this is a webinar from the International ZEV Alliance, and since we have a diverse mix of attendees today, I'll just very quickly explain what the ZEV Alliance is and what we think makes it so useful for uh, the transition to zero emission clean transportation. So the ZEV Alliance is a coalition of national and state or provincial governments. And you can see the current membership up on the screen now. We are now 20 governments strong with Chile and Costa Rica as our two newest members. And what makes this group so special, uh, as seen on the next slide, is that these governments collaborate really closely together at the expert staff level on ZEV policy in order to accelerate the ZEV transition within our own jurisdictions and around the world. And so, uh, the governments do this through monthly meetings, uh, by sharing reports and data and market updates, by hosting events and workshops and public webinars like this one, and uh, importantly, by choosing three focus areas every year for deeper research. And one of the focus areas for 2021 was on understanding and supporting the used ZEV market. It was really a high priority for all of the governments in the ZEV Alliance. And so the ICCT was very happy to uh, conduct some research on this topic. And today we're excited not only to share some of the conclusions and the findings from this research, but also to release the uh, full paper. So we will hear more about that uh, shortly and we'll circulate it in the follow-up email as well. So now without uh, any further ado, let's dive right into our content today, and I will turn it over to Alex. Thank you so much, Dell. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, like Dell just mentioned, my name is Alexander Tenku. I'm an associate electric vehicle researcher at the International Council on Clean Transportation. And today, my role will be to discuss some of the key findings uh, of our UZEP market research research that we conducted on behalf of the ZEV Alliance and in close collaboration with them. Next slide, please. 
So the report is entitled Understanding and Supporting the Use at Market. It builds on an extensive literature review as well as modeling analysis to describe some of the important characteristics of the use at market. This include age of vehicles, sales registration, or um, distance traveled. He also identify unique challenges of this particular market. Most of them relate to technological reliability, especially in regard to the battery. And finally, he formulates policy recommendation to ensure that the user market provides a successful experience to its customers. So one of the first good news that I'm gonna announce today is that uh, the report is now publicly available and it can be accessed either through the Zavalence website or the ICCT website. Next slide, please. So before I dive into the research, I would like to talk a little bit about the motivation. So it all started back in October, 2020, when we sent a survey uh, to the Zavalence member asking them to vote for their favorite uh, research topic for the year 2021. And it turns out that the USAV market came out as the second highest scoring topic. On public discussion, we then asked them, why is this topic such an important, such an important topic for your jurisdiction? And they told us that uh, the user market is an opportunity, an opportunity to increase the share of user on the road. And also it gives them better chance uh, to achieve not only their climate goal, but also their cleaner objectives. They also mentioned that through the user market, there is an opportunity to broaden market participation, especially in underserved community, which so far has been mostly excluded from the ZEV transition. But of course, the Z market presents different challenges. Most of them relate to technological reliability. For example, customers fear that through the user market, they will be more exposed to battery failure. They also feel they also very uncertain about maintenance costs and um, uncertain about like compatibility with DC fast charging in that. So if you want, the, those challenges in barrier also build on the motivation for this research because we really wanted to identify the best practices that can ensure that the use of market provide a successful experience to its customers. Next slide, please. So now diving into the, 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 the findings of the report. So one thing that's important to understand is that because of the fast technology development that we are currently observing in the ZEV industry, use ZEV depreciate faster than use conventional vehicle. On the figure that I'm showing here on the right, we kind of see what that looks like for the case of the US, where you see 200 miles battery electric vehicles that appear in blue and 300 miles battery electric vehicles that happen in red. And you see those prices in comparison to the, uh, to, to the prices of a used conventional vehicle. So for the case of the US, we see that under the depreciation dynamics that I just described, we see that the 200 mile BEV vehicle which is cost parity with the used conventional vehicle around 2025. And the 300 mile, the used 300 mile BEV vehicle reach cost parity with that used conventional vehicle around 2026, so about a year later. And uh, generally speaking, uh, our global finding, uh, our model find that globally, uh, at least in the leading Z market, cost parity is used is, is rich in the use of market around 2025 and 2028. Next slide, please. So of course, it's good news that um, the use of market will present unprecedented opportunities for more affordable Z. But another important question is what about the supplies? Will those vehicles be available for the mass? So this leads us to the second finding. We find that the use of could surpass first owner Z by the early 2040s. So our model find that um, from about 1 million user vehicle as of 2020, we could expect about 500 million new ZEV by, 20, by the early 2040s. And from there, user will become the largest part of the global ZEV fleet. So this is what I'm showing on the figure on the right, where you see the growth of the new ZEV market in blue and the growth of the user market in this red area. And you see that um, somewhere around the early 2040, 20, 20, 2043, uh, the USEV, so the red area, surpasses for the first time the blue line, which is uh, the new vehicle, uh, vehicle stock. Next slide, please. 
So another way to understand what the growth of the user market could look like is not only to compare it uh, through um, first on reserve, but also through combustion engine. And this is what I'm showing on the figure on the right, where you're seeing combustion engine evolution between 2021 and 2015 in gray. You also see first on reserve in green and UZEV in red. So our model shows that um, from a global speed that increased to about from, from 1.4 billion to about uh, 2 billion between 2020 and 2050, USEF could be about half of the global fleet by 2050. And this compared to about 20% for combustion for combustion engine vehicles and 30% for force runner ZEF. Next slide, please. So of course, it's good news to know that um, we're having more and more supply, more and more availability of those affordable USEF over time. But the, what really matters is to ensure that this growth translates into uptake. But in order to do that, governments will have to put in place measures that reassure consumers about USEF. So through the literature review that we conducted, we identified so-called assurance provision measures, which are measures that governments are planning in order to reassure consumers on USEF. Examples of those measures include, for example, um, transparency on battery state of health data, so the state of health data is kind of like a measure of, of how well your battery is doing. It's often calculated by dividing the actual capacity of the battery after it has been used for several years over its initial capacity. Um, it, uh, using that data, customer could kind of have a better sense of what will be the performance of their vehicle, for example. Um, government could also um, pass what we refer to as warranty requirements. So that would take the form of like uh, requiring manufacturer to design longer warranties so that the battery is covered for a longer period of time. Similarly, governments could also introduce battery durability requirement. So the idea would be to like have manufacturer build long lasting batteries. So batteries that have a large lo number of cycles. Um, we also find that uh, few jurisdictions have considered what we refer to as right to repair laws. So under those laws, third party auto shop will have access to the data they need to repair USEV, but ZEV in general actually. And um, that could be reassuring knowing that the current um, ZEV repair capacity is kind of somewhat limited and also very centralized. Other important measure we re will consist of like assuring that uh, Populations have access to charging, especially like remote and undeserved communities. And also that over time, uh, compatibility with DC fast charging is let uh, or, or maintained. Next slide, please. So as we were conducting all this research and identifying all those promising policies, a question that we asked ourselves is, um, what is the data evidence? Do we have any sort of like suggestion, uh, evidence that suggests that those policies are effective in the USEF market? And we came to realize that as of today, there is very little evidence that proves the effectiveness of those policy. That is why one of the main recommendations that we're making in this, in this report for government is that uh, in this early stage of the um, use that market is crucial to introduce those policies as small scale project. Those will help in filling out the many information gap that we're currently facing by collecting data, developing um, tracking system and defining metric of success of what the success should look like in the user market. And with that, that concludes my short presentation on the finding of the report. Thank you so much for your attention. Dell, um, giving you back the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, great overview, and uh, there is certainly a lot more material in our research report that's now available online. Uh, so we will send that link to everyone uh, today or in, in the follow-up email as well. But next, I'm really excited to hear about one of the most promising projects that is collecting a lot of data and testing out some innovative policies to support the used market. And that is uh, Oregon and the Clean Vehicle Rebate Program. So I'm very excited to welcome uh, Rachel Sakata, the program 
uh, Manager and Senior Air Quality Planner at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Great, thanks Dale, and good morning everyone. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today. And as Dale mentioned, I am the Program Manager for our Oregon Clean Vehicle Rebate. Um, and so really I'm here just to provide an overview of you know, our program. Um, and basically it includes an incentive for used EVs. And we've um, been collecting some information um, from our applicants. And so I'm going to provide a little bit of initial um, data that we've been able to gather from our used um, ZEB rebate participants. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm just gonna provide a little bit of background first, just to kind of orient everyone to our program. Um, so the Oregon Clean Vehicle Rebate Program, or the OCVRP as we call it, um, was created back in 2017 by our Oregon legislature. And it basically directed our agency um, to create and implement an electric vehicle rebate program. And so funding for our program is generated via a tax imposed on car dealers for the privilege of selling a motor vehicle. And we receive $12 million a year for the program. And it's just significant for us here, just because in Oregon, we don't have any sales tax. So this is a significant allowance. And this tax is basically 0.5% of um, a tax that's imposed upon the dealers. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so there are essentially, there are two components to our rebate program. We have what are called standard rebates and charge ahead rebates. And under the standard rebate program, you know, rebates are offered to any Oregonian for the purchase or lease of a new um, EV. And then um, the rebate amount is tiered and it depends on the battery capacity of the vehicle. And then I wanna focus on the charge ahead rebates, which are an income-based incentive. Um, and this is for low and moderate income households only. And it's basically a flat $2,000 uh, $500 rebate available for anyone who purchases or leases a new or used electric vehicle. And we do have a few other conditions um, in that the vehicle does have to have an MSRP of less than $50,000. They do have to register the car in Oregon and maintain that registration for two years. But the nice thing about our charge ahead rebate is, you know, not only do we uh, rebate used vehicles, but we allow folks who are purchasing new vehicles to combine it with our standard rebate. So then you could get up to a combined $5,000 off of an EV. But if we go to the next slide, you know, we really, you know, want to focus on the charge ahead rebate, which is, you know, where the incentive for the used EVs are. So we recently adopted program changes. Um, and so starting January 1st of 2022, we've doubled the amount that charge ahead rebate applicants can receive. And so instead of $2,500, they can now get $5,000 off the purchase or use lease of a used vehicle. And so that's really a significant savings if you're you know, looking at the used EV market and you say you have, you know, for example, a Nissan Leaf that's going for $7,000, you know, $5,000 can really uh, knock down the price. And then again, you know, just to note, if they are purchasing new, um, they can come out with their standard rebate and receive up to $7,500. Um, we do have another provision um, that does ensure that a certain percentage of funding is dedicated to these low and moderate income households who are purchasing, you know, potentially these used EVs. And so up to now, um, we've set aside at least 10% of funds, but the latest program changes increases it to 20% beginning in 2022. You know, and I just want to note that, you know, this 20%, um, we sort of see that as a floor, not as a ceiling, because we definitely want to get more participation from the low and moderate income households, more participation, you know, more involvement in the used EV market as well. Um, and, you know, and we think that this uh, rebate is great because it really helps increase the market for used EVs because, you know, not only are we incenting new EVs and making sure that more of them are coming onto the market, but then, you know, it also provides this rebate for the used EVs. So then, um, you know, a lot of the new EVs that are coming off lease um, are now made available for folks to purchase and then uh, utilize our rebate um, to assist in their purchasing decision. So if you want to go to the next slide. So I just want to kind of give just some program stats as to, you know, where we are. 
you know, since the program's inception, uh, when we actually began issuing rebates in 2018, we've awarded over 16,000 rebates for a total of almost $40 million thus far. Um, you know, again, I'll just note that over 10% of these rebates went to our low and moderate income households, which is in line with our existing program goals. And we anticipate that we'll be able to meet the 20% program goal um, next year. And, you know, and overall, we've rebated approximately 5% of the total rebates to use DVs. Um, and so I hope that with the increased uh, rebate amount that will begin next year, um, since only the low and moderate income um, households are able to receive these rebates for these DVs, it will mean more participation and potentially more used DV purchases. Uh, let's see here, if we go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, forgot about that little graphic that I had there. All right, so um, so basically, you know, one of the things that we do have with our program is that we um, conduct surveys. And so we send out uh, surveys post rebate to um, all applicants who've received a rebate. Uh, we currently have about a 30% response rate, which is, you know, pretty good overall. And, you know, really the purpose of our survey is to kind of just get a measure of program satisfaction, you know, determine the influence of our rebate program and um, other rebates um, that our state has available on their decision to adopt an EV, um, and, and also to help us understand uh, vehicle and household uh, demographics, um, and also to understand, you know, what were some of the motivating, fact motivating factors that uh, were important for them to adopt an electric vehicle. And just, um, you know, lastly, just to kind of assess sort of the changing behavior of folks. Um, a lot of uh, people who are participating in our rebate program are first time EV buyers. And so, you know, we are asking, you know, what cars, or, you know, were they drive what kinds of cars were they driving before if they had a car? Um, so we've, you know, been sending out surveys in sort of initial batches. Um, now we have an automated system where um, a survey is sent once their rebate is approved. And so we did do an initial push at the beginning of the program, but it did not capture sort of our charge ahead rebates use vehicle purchasers because um, we did have a little bit of delay in beginning implementation of this program. So, you know, some of the information that we just recently received, we are still kind of mining through it. Um, and so I do hope that in the near future, we will have more information we'll be able to share, but I did, you know, was able to kind of tease out some initial things. Um, you know, because we really want to sort of get a sense of what's going on with the used EV side um, and, you know, how we can provide some good information on, you know, how our low and moderate income households are adopting these vehicles. So if we go to the next slide, please. So here are some of the preliminary stats. Um, so just in general, um, you know, we have, we kind of compiled a list of, you know, what are the sort of the used EVs that are receiving rebates thus far in Oregon. And so um, we were able to determine that, you know, the top three are the Nissan Leaf, uh, the Chevy Bolt, and the Fiat um, 500E. I would imagine though, uh, we've had quite a bit of Tesla participation. And so, um, you know, we were definitely seeing sort of more of an uptick in uh, Tesla, used Tesla EVs coming onto the market. And so um, that may affect our numbers in the future. Um, but basically, uh, you know, just in general, uh, what we were able to find is that, you know, some of the influences for buying an EV were just, you know, for to reduce environmental impacts, to save money overall, to save money on fuel costs. So generally, in general, this is their first EV purchase. And uh, the majority of our rebate participants do charge at home, as well as they are um, Caucasian male with a college degree or higher. Um, so, um, you know, we, it, it's sort of helpful information to understand, you know, who's currently taking advantage of it and then also where we need to focus in the future um, to sort of ensure that all Oregonians are able to participate in our program. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So I kind of want to touch a little bit on some of the program challenges and lessons learned so far with our um, rebate. Uh, you know, one thing is definitely uh, increasing rebate accessibility. Um, so right now, our program only um, allows EVs purchased at a dealership to qualify for a rebate. So we do not allow person-to-person -person sales um, to be rebated. And it may 
make it more challenging for people who are looking to buy used EVs um, who might be um, you know using Craigslist or some other mechanism to get them. But you know sort of it was a program decision because we did want to mitigate the opportunity for people to gain the system. So instead what we're doing because it does require a dealer a purchase at a dealership is we've been partnering with dealerships to provide rebates at the point of purchase or lease. And we do have over 80 dealerships participating statewide. Um, right now, this only applies for new EV purchases, but our plan is to incorporate um, the ability for the used EVs, used EV dealers to be able to offer this. Uh, what sort of complicates this is, you know, the, our participants do have to meet certain income requirements. And so we are starting to uh, and hope to initiate a pre-qualification program uh, this next year that will allow applicants to pre-apply, get income verified, and then be able to get the rebate at the point of purchase for their used EVs. You know, we recognize that one of the barriers um, for EV purchases, particularly for our low market income households who could qualify for used EVs, is uh, the ability to get uh, loans or financing to make that upfront investment. So having the rebate applied at the point of sale will help mitigate that. Um, so if we go to the next slide. And then another challenge, you know, too, is just awareness of our program, awareness of electric vehicles in general. Um, you know, we're still working to increase knowledge and understanding of EVs, of charging, and just new availability of our rebate program. Um, there's still hesitancy about the technology, how to charge, ability charge, you know, not knowing about the rebate, and um, as Alex mentioned, you know, just some of just the battery concerns as well. And so, you know, we're moving as we move forward, you know, we're seeing that in some of the survey results. And so I think we're looking to sort of frame some of our tools and information to help um, reach out to various communities who could take advantage of these used EVs. And we recognize that, you know, we need to work closely with a lot of these community-based organizations um, because we've heard that the messenger matters about how to receive information and just making them feel comfortable with EVs and used EVs in general. Um, so let's see here if we go to the next slide. And then, you know, another thing we've just encountered here in Oregon is just the available of used EVs for purchase or lease. You know, the pandemic definitely has exacerbated the issue just in terms of um, supply issues. But hopefully, it was, as I mentioned, you know, with some of the newer cars coming off lease in the next few years, it will increase um, availability. Um, another barrier, you know, that we've seen in some of the surveys is just concern about charging availability. You know, while most of the charging from our rebate applicants does appear to occur at home, uh, you know, we, there's still um, concerns about charging availability for longer trips and especially when going to rural areas and, you know, with the used EVs, just sort of, um, you know, the battery sort of degradation issue as well and having to charge more frequently. Um, you know, we see opportunities basically to increase engagement, participation with EVs, you know, particularly with dealer engagement. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we saw with our surveys is that, um, you know, th they felt that uh, one a good opportunity would be is to try before you buy would help increase comfortability in EV adoption and just, you know, in general um, awareness and education. Um, so, you know, that is, like I said, just sort of a general overview of, you know, what we've learned here in Oregon. If you go to the next slide, um, it's just, you know, my contact information if anyone has more questions about it. Uh, but, you know, as we continue to sort of mine through our data, I do hope to provide um, some more updated information um, about, you know, where our used EV program is going. So, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Rachel. We're uh, really excited to see these initial results and also see the program continue to develop and continue to learn more lessons as the market uh, really expands in the coming years. Uh, a quick reminder very quickly to the audience to please type your questions in the question box uh, for Rachel or for any of the speakers and we will get to those um, uh, in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. And we are looking forward to that discussion. But now, as Alex and Rachel both mentioned, uh, the potential for use of is really huge, but perhaps the biggest and most unique challenge for the market has to do with battery longevity or perceptions about battery longevity. And this is an area where we certainly realize there 
has not been a lot of data available so far. So we're really excited to hear from Scott Case, the CEO of Recurrent, a company that's really trying to change our understanding of EV batteries. So Scott, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to check, you can see my screen, right? Awesome, all right. Well, hi everybody, thanks for joining. Um, I, my quick background, I've spent the last 10 years um, in climate tech actually for with a um, firm called Energy Savvy working on home energy efficiency. So, and then uh, co-founded Recurrent uh, last year in 2020. So real quick on Recurrent, we provide, um, our company provides EV specific condition reports on used electric vehicles. Uh, we work with dealers and shoppers to help them buy and sell used EVs with confidence around all well, the battery. Um, so um, just as a, like all my numbers are US centric, so I will just say every year in the US, 17 million new cars and 40 million used car sales, and those numbers have been essentially flat for years. Um, where that takes us to in five years, one in five new cars will be electric, and after a bit of a lag, one in five used will be electric as well. Um, now that change wouldn't be a big deal if we were just talking about like an upgraded turbo injector on, on a combustion engine car, but these vehicles are physically different and people get that. Um, you know, Dale brought up like the, what's the mental model here? And oopsie, I think I'm sharing a little bit of the, the video. There we go. Um, what's the mental model here? Well, people bring a mental model of everybody's had an iPhone long enough to know like the battery wears down in that. And they bring that to the idea of when they go to buy a, a used combustion engine or used EV. Um, so this is a survey that was done a couple of years ago uh, about the biggest concerns people have when uh, considering an EV. And not surprisingly, like it's, uh, you know, most of them are about the battery. The two that were not, you know, this was like, again, a couple of years ago were cost and vehicle selection. Those two things are solving themselves. So what's left is concerns about the battery. Um, so when we launched, when we first launched, we we actually didn't start immediately with the condition report because we needed a whole bunch of data. So we actually first started with a with a monthly um, driver report. So it turns out like people that own EVs don't have a great sense of uh, how their own battery is doing either, especially compared to other cars. Um, so um, we launched our, this product or uh, it's service really, I guess, like last September. And at this point we have uh, over 7,000 vehicles actively connected to our platform. Um, and we're getting data from all of those and, um, and using that to, well, inform our scoring process for cars that are for sale, but also, you know, being able to aggregate and share data um, like what we're doing today. Um, so uh, to have 7,000 vehicles we're drawing data from, what's that really mean? Well, um, any driver, and this is a free service um, that anybody, any EV driver can sign up for, they um, choose to share their battery data with us from their vehicle telematics. And we're getting uh, data three times a day, and it's five data points, I will say. It's the, um, the vehicle's uh, odometer, its state of charge at each moment, uh, at each of those three times, um, the vehicle's range estimate uh, from the battery management system, whether it's plugged in or not, whether it's charging or not. So that's the five data points we get three times a day. Uh, in exchange for that, sharing that data, um, the owner gets a, like a monthly um, uh, battery report basically that says, hey, here's how your car is doing versus like all the other Model 3s, for instance, that we see in our fleet. And, uh, and then also gives them some tips on how to, to keep their battery in great shape over the long term. Um, the mix of vehicles that we have on the platform is pretty proportionate to the EVs on the road in, in the US, with a couple of gaps uh, just based on connectivity issues. Um, but, um, but importantly, they're also all over the US. So we have um, vehicles now in all 50 states. So we're seeing these cars in lots of different weather conditions. Uh, so what have we learned? Uh, and you know, so far what we're learning is very, and what we're focusing on is very battery centric. But eventually we're going to be, you know, go broader to to think about everything that's EV specific about um, or, uh, about the used car market. Um, so diving in, a couple like kind of lessons here. Um, first thing is od odometers don't matter. Like uh, this is like a big thing. I'll talk about what does in a second. But just to illustrate this point, um, we had a um, a used uh, 2013 Nissan Leaf. Um, it came through one of our dealers uh, with less than 20,000 miles. And, you know, for a combustion engine car, you, you'd say, well, eight-year-old car, less than 20,000 miles, like that's an amazing deal. Um, this car, this battery was uh, baked. It was, it had been in Southern California for its life and it was getting barely 40 miles of range uh, compared to a 75 mile original EPA range. Um, worse in, 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 uh, in bad weather, in cold weather. 
on the other sort of extreme, um, every Chevy Bolt ever made is, is about to get a brand new battery. We have a thousand of these connected uh, on our platform and um, with some of them up to 75,000 miles. So uh, every single one of them is basically about to be a brand new car uh, once the recalls are complete. Um, so again, two wildly different examples that really run counter to the to the to um, our understanding of how vehicles age and the, and the odometer being the, that kind of proxy. Uh, so what if a donor doesn't matter then what does well a whole bunch of factors do um, but these are different the the and the importance of each of these is different for every oem and uh, and it's different based on like the way people treat their vehicles um, and there's even i'll even say what's not on this list is even some variants even in brand new batteries like we see some cars like right off the gates uh, right out of the gates uh, when they're brand new and and we see some variants even within those new cars and uh, in terms of like what range they're displaying at the same weather conditions and the same driving styles. Um, so um, <laughs> the answer is it's complicated of, of, of sort of how, how what actually does matter in these. But oh, before I move on, I will say, but in general, <laughs> um, the batteries are holding up, I think, better than people's perceptions of how they were, how they do. And again, like remember, the perception is informed by the iPhone sort of experience. So, um, uh, so uh, it, it's it's better than perception, but there's a ton of variability. Um, so one thing that a lot of like people say, well, hey, why can't we just like you know plug it in, charge it up, see what the dashboard says, you know? Or as some dealers say, like, well, range is range is king for a used EV buyer. So um, so why don't I just do that? Uh, well, the answer is because the the dashboard display of range is all over the place, and uh, these are just two examples to from our data that that's actually published on our website. Um, uh, you know, you know, somewhat extreme examples, but you know, two pretty popular uh, models of cars. So now, here you see, in general, like there is a in in the break-in period, you know, the first sort of 20,000 miles or so, there's about a 40-mile drop in general. <laughs> if you can sort of like kind of get, glean from those clouds of data around uh, for the Chevy Bolt, and a 20-mile drop in the range of uh, Model 3s. Um, but there's so much variance around that, you know, especially in the Chevy side. Uh, and so what you're seeing is like just all the other factors that are not sort of explained in these graphs that just does this on the odometer basis. We chose the, the odometer as an x-axis just to sort of yeah, underscore the point that odometer like doesn't matter as much. Um, so um, the the other thing you see is, or that we've have, we have observed in the data is, um, is that, uh, the there are systematic um, you know, biases and and just well there's two two factors of why there's why that variability one is um, one is is a uh, um, you know real environmental differences in how cars are treated that um, it you know in terms of the the long term degradation but then there's also plenty of short term degrada uh, short term um, variances based on weather and then there are some manufacturer sort of biases that we've observed of you know. Um, I'll say some manufacturers are maybe more optimistic in how they how their battery management system presents range to the user, which is really the same information we're using is like is 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 what it's presented to the to the driver in different conditions. Um, so um, the the anecdote to that or the antidote to that is we're just using a lot of data, which is sort of my next slide. Um, and 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 um, to essentially, in a, in a sense, reverse engineer like what the battery management systems are saying and what they actually sort of think and and what that means, you know, when you sort of look at it over a lot of readings over a lot of different weather conditions. Um, so um, uh, we started doing this research or started doing this work in summer 2020, and um, and just to underscore how much like data matters and in, in, in order to do that like we've seen just huge improvements as as uh, in our in our predictive algorithms um, uh, you know from as you go from tens to hundreds to thousands of vehicles of each type and as we see more data from each individual car over time um, and you know these are just some examples of of you know what you're seeing here sorry the well, the labels got sort of pulled off this but you know on the on the x-axis here you're seeing like how many cars we have and then on the on the y-axis like what our sort of average uh, error is basically in terms of like predictive error um, same here time versus predicted error so more time and more cars equals um, you know a better prediction for any car that's for sale 
Um, the next step for us, I think I have one more build on this. Oh, this is just, oh yeah, this this next step for us is is looking at uh, different uh, data sources and sort of cross-referencing those. So for example, uh, and then we see again, as we've gone so far, we've seen um, that more uh, different data types, like when we correlate them in, like increases our accuracy as well. Um, one thing, an example of this that we haven't actually um, published yet is we kicked off, we just kicked off a new um, research effort that was actually uh, funded by a National Science Foundation grant um, to cross-reference uh, all the, the models that we're creating, which are sort of based on over-the-air data from vehicle telematics with plug-in diagnostics. Um, so we now have, of our 7,000 cars, there are 100 of them that have um, plug-in um, uh, sort of telematics devices that they'll that the owners have volunteered to, to do and they have they'll they'll um, drive around with them for 12 weeks and then uh, send them back um, and and then get like an advanced analytics report from their um, from that data that really cross references that with all the over there data um, that's really neat because we're getting sort of like a much more granular sample of, of, of range data and we can kind of see what's how how uh, cars are biasing their their range estimates um, over time. And here's where I'll just open it up and say, like, all of this for EV owners is free, and uh, and and you know where it's it's um, you know you you choose to share how much data you you want to choose uh, for this research. So uh, here I'll, I'll say we're you know we're looking to partner for you know to find. Um, uh, other vehicle owners that that are willing to sign up and share data, um, you know, and we'll continue to to publish this data to for the benefit of all. So, if there's anyone on the call who's like, oh yeah, like I'd love to do this. Like we would love to talk with you, and uh, and and figure out how to 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 you know share data in both directions. Um, so the the last bit of this as I kind of wrap up is like you know our last lessons are less about the battery and just more about like what people are asking in the in the used car purchasing process around you know batteries um so and and sort of where we're going next you know the the, the question you hear from used car buyers like over and over again and it's it is essentially how's the battery in that thing you know I, I'm, I'm looking at a car this is just a fundamentally different question than anyone ever asked for uh, combustion cars and um, what i think is interesting is that one question asked in lots of different ways like means that um, there are many, many different questions that that you know dealers, wholesalers, uh, fleet auction or fleet uh, remarketers have to think about, and you know sort of as you look upstream. Um, and what I've what's been very clear to us like early on is like the industry, the ecosystem is not ready to answer these yet. Um, so that's why we're here. We're trying to help, but um, but that's that's the that's the reality of like this one simple question gets very complicated uh, very quickly. And then last thing I'll say is like, you know, most of the current uh, EV owners that are sharing data with us are early adopters. You know, this is like my friend who has a Tesla and I, you know, I don't want to go on a road trip with him because he won't shut up about his Tesla the entire time. Um, you know, they just love wallowing in the data and and they're willing to share it with us and, you know, talk talk about it and sort of like point out problems when we when we have them. Um, they're, we've seen they're tolerant of a lot of rough experiences, both with their cars and with us, you know, from a data perspective. Um, what I think is so interesting, and we borrowed this graph from a blog called Green Flux, so just to call them out, is like this is about to change this sort of like the shifting from early adopters to majority buyers. Um, over the last 18 months, um, it, the the numbers of like people who are saying I'll consider an EV for my next car purchase, you know, has changed very very quickly from 20% up to about 70%. And so these are definitely the mainstream buyers. And those folks, we have interacted with them, they are not as tolerant with rough experiences. So they're asking those questions, so like how's the battery in that EV that I'm considering? What kind of range am I gonna get now versus when the car was new? What's that gonna be in three years? Like all those questions that are informed by the, their experience with lithium, other rechargeable lithium ion batteries, and they need simple answers to, to, to make this market work. Um, so thank you for the time. Let me just leave you with an open invitation to connect and talk EVs and talk data. You know, our goal here is to help upgrade the entire used auto ecosystem for the transitions to EV. Thanks. Oh, I think I have to stop sharing. Oh, you did it for me. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, this work that you're leading is really innovative and it was certainly very helpful for our research on this uh, project with the Alliance. So 
uh, we're very happy that you're doing it and hope it continues to grow. Um, so yeah, to the audience, please uh, continue typing questions in the question box on the side of your screen and we will get to those shortly. But uh, last but not least, we are also very excited to hear from Asir Khalid, a director at EBA England, uh, to share how this association of EV drivers is dealing with the growing used uh, EV market in England and what concerns they're hearing from drivers and what uh, some solutions might look like. So Asir, please go ahead. Thanks, Dale. So um, as, as Dale mentioned, I'm a director, a volunteer director. EV England is actually a, a community interest company. So it's a non-profit company and, um, uh, and uh, I'm a director and on, on board member on there. Uh, next slide, please. And so what is EVA England? Well, it's, it's, it's there for members and it's also an advocacy organisation. So we are here to try and promote the, the concerns and the needs of, of EV drivers, inspired by uh, associations in Scotland, Netherlands, US, uh, Norway, of course, who have existed for a number of years already. We've only been in existence for uh, since last summer, actually. It was, it's been brought together in, uh, during the lockdown. Uh, so one of the good things that's come out of the lockdown. And uh, our aim is essentially to, to help new drivers or existing EV drivers understand the technology, understand their, their pain points and, and, promote, uh, and promote the shift to the you know, zero emission vehicles. Next slide, please. So one of the things about this presentation was to talk about used cars. We can't really talk about used cars without understanding what's happening in, in the actual uh, new car market. So it's already been mentioned in, in some of the other slides. In, in England, we can see that uh, the acceleration of electrified vehicles has, uh, has you know, has had, as it now happened. And uh, these are only 2020 figures. 2021 is actually a lot greater than, than 2020. Uh, and we see a, a massive growth on, on uh, plug-in hybrids and, and battery electric, so full battery electric uh, uh, vehicles over the last uh, over the last year. So a lot of interest. Uh, in part, a lot of this is down to uh, and, and thanks to government incentives, European incentives, and also the the fleet buyers. So fleet buyers are aware now, and they've. They've been buying these vehicles for their their fleets, and this is all very good news because essentially there's now a pipeline. So in two or three years' time, we'll have those new cars appear on the second-hand market. So the current status, and this is the donut diagram on on the right side of the of the page, shows the that the bevs at the moment are 0.6% of the fleet. So this is the entire fleet of of licensed vehicles. In, in England, and we can see that diesel is still very popular, but then it was incentivized by the government for a number of years. Petrol is, has always been quite popular in the UK. Um, but the, the key interesting point is that at 0.6% for BEVs, we're also seeing that used car sales are actually following this trend. So for Q4 2020, we saw 1.12% of uh, Be used BEV sales. Uh, 0.39 for Q1, 0.5 in Q2 of this year, and then in the in Q3, the quarter for this year was 0.69. So actually aligns really nicely that we can see that the used market, um, there's probably pent up uh, demand because of the semiconductor shortages and other shortages affecting, well, affecting all areas of life at the moment. But uh, we can certainly see that there's a there's a there's a nice trend in, in the used car market following the the actual um, size of the market. Next slide, please. So we also wanted to look at the the user experience from trying to find a, a used car. And nowadays we would normally uh, go online. So this is just an example on the on the left hand side where we, we can actually see that the that online search engines are now catering for electric vehicles. So here we can see all the different types. There's hybrids, diesel hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and electric. However, there's still a little bit of confusion, and this is maybe caused by incorrect data being entered by the advertisers themselves. 
So if we look at the, the top right, we can see that Bakshi quick charge time ranges from one hour to, to 15 hours. So th there may be a, 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 a misunderstanding of what is DC fast charging or what is AC level two charging on, on those figures. Certainly one hour seems a little bit short. And then on the battery charge time, we have the same sort of effect. You can see this is it, a bit more uh, extrapolated in terms of time, but it's again, three hours to 40 hours. So is this talking about AC level two charging or are we talking granny charging cable, uh, which is uh, essentially level one charging? So there's there's still a need to try and get the, the correct data to remove the confusion um, amongst those who are advertising and then make it easier for those who are searching for used vehicles. Next slide, please. So the pain points. So we went out, we asked uh, um, our members and, uh, and EV drivers in general, what were their pain points? What did they see in, in England as being a big problem with the, with the used cars? And the first is, of course, is cost. And this is probably due to the fact that they were expensive vehicles and the young age of the, the vehicle stock currently on the used car market. And then the demand is high. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, customers also currently are doing their own research and they're looking at online platforms, but essentially they're finding that information is often incorrect. And so this is where uh, a website might be still catering towards you know, internal combustion engines. And this really leads to you know, misinformation and, and confusing data. So it's important that EV options, EV specific options are listed to allow the buyers to actually fine tune their own search and then there's also a general lack of knowledge amongst non-specialized EV, uh, non-specialized dealers on EVs. Next slide, please. So then we did the other side. So we talked about those who are buying used cars. Then we looked at those who are trying to sell used cars. We went to the EV dealerships, those who have been selling EVs for a number of years, who've uh, been in the market, uh, it started maybe five, six years ago, maybe even earlier. And uh, and what were what were they seeing? What was the trend that they're seeing in in the market? So this is just um, this is the first comment is actually a specific comment from one dealer who has said that they were de you know they were selling only one or two in a fortnight, but now they're four a week. And actually, that four a week is actually it's it's limited because they can't get a hold of the stock. So the availability of stock is now reduced, partly because uh, online supermarkets such as Kazoo and, and others in, in the UK cinch are now in this market where they, they offer a turnkey solution where they will pick up your car and, and then deliver a car to your door. Partly because other dealerships, used car dealerships and, fran and franchise dealerships are seeing that the used car market for electric vehicles is buoyant. And this is this is the market they want to move into. So there's there's more competition for selling used EVs, and there's a lack of re, a lack of stock. Uh, the key point there, a couple of key points that that have already been mentioned, mileage isn't as much of a consideration. The key questions are of course state of health of the battery, and if it's not state of health, um, it's about the range. How far can I get with the car? So most customers that they're seeing, 80%, uh, and this has been a figure that's been mentioned by a number of the EV dealerships, 80% are actually new car buyers. So they, they're not they're not first they're first time EV buyers, uh, and so this is a for them. Although it's a second hand car, this is the first time they're going to experience an electric vehicle. And then, in terms of warranties, there are specific warranties now already being offered by some companies in in the market. Next slide, please. So from this, what are the key important details? We've mentioned it a number of times, but we'll just go through it again quickly. It is the real world range, this estimation of what the car will actually travel. To give confidence uh, to any buyer, they need to understand that the car is actually suitable for their usage. And so the summer and winter ranges are important. The battery state of health, which has also been mentioned previously, and the usable size. So what do I mean by usable size? So in, in the UK, we have quite a, uh, and in England, we have quite a buoyant market, partly because in the European car makers are selling a lot of electric vehicles. So we have a lot of variety, but among that, some 
car makers will mention the full battery size and some will mention the usable. This is minus the buffers. So it's an important point that all this, this consistency of information is, is still missing. Uh, warranty uh, at the moment is not as maybe a great an issue because a lot of them are currently under warranty with manufacturer's warranties, be that for the battery, the drivetrain or for other parts. But again, it's not clear what is the warranty that covers a specific model or a specific car. Charging cable, charging types and some of the other parts that you'd expect, but maybe one of the most important points is safety and CCS. So CCS, DC fast charging, um, is now becoming commonplace, but it hasn't always been in all models. So Zoe ZE50 had the option to come with and without a CCS port on it. So this is a problem in the used car market because uh, this uh, you need to understand if it has that DC fast charging. And if you're new to used uh, to EVs, you may not be aware of this specific requirement. Another one uh, is the uh, the charging rate. So the Skoda ENIAC charges at 50 kilowatts when it was first launched, and it was an optional upgrade that you had to pay for uh, to allow 100 kilowatts. Even though all battery packs would be able to handle 100 kilowatts, it was an optional upgrade to allow 100 kilowatts charging. Uh, next slide, please. So for the potential policy recommendations, this is where we can see that how can we incentivize the used car market? The first one really is uh, very similar to, to our, uh, our, uh, Rachel's uh, comment. It's about means tested loans to provide means tested loans. Uh, and that way we can actually help support those low income families. The second is battery certificates. So validating the health of the battery, providing a system which is um, gives assurance to the used car buyer that the battery is in a state that will, you know, the battery is, is good, it will the car will work and, and there are no concerns. There's other areas that we can incentivize, we can reduce the tax or VAT burden on used, used or secondhand vehicles, which are uh, electric vehicles or uh, shall we say ZEVs as opposed to plug-in hybrids possibly and introduction of a scrappage scheme to try and get rid of those oldest, dirtiest vehicles off the road and, and transition people specifically towards uh, ZEVs. And the last point is actually standardizing the information. So this, we've talked about the, the confusion of information which, which comes out again and again, and Zemo Partnership is working on an initiative for this. So I'll talk about this on the, on the, next, on the next slide, please. So, the, the image on, on, the, on the right of the slide, this is a, a, is a certificate what that this was developed and was launched in June of 2020. So this is very new. And it was, uh, it was designed as it, uh, to try and provide clear information about the total cost of ownership for a car. And this particular car obviously has electric miles, it's a plug-in hybrid, and it also talks about battery uh, it's very difficult to read, but it's actually uh, battery consumption. It's it's uh, near the bottom, and second line up from the bottom of the of the of the image. And so we got a, a simple figure. This was a three and a half miles per kilo uh, for a kilowatt hour, or it could be kilometers if the, if that's the the default um, uh, parameter. And this allows a user when a, a buyer to come, take a look, understand what's the efficiency of the car, how far will I be able to get in the car. Of course, we would also prefer on, on this type of uh, form for it to actually state a worst case a winter figure and then a summer figure. And so the Zemo partnership is now looking to take this new car environmental label and then to be adapted for used cars. And this is maybe a, a key area where if it is provided then users through online or going to a garage or going to any any other areas uh, they can uh, they can have a, a clear idea before they look at the car that they understand what the car is they can compare that car to another car or a, a car it could be a car it could be a van that vehicle can be compared uh, to any other vehicle that they're they're interested in and they can understand if it's suitable for their needs Next slide. And so the, those are our contact details. Obviously, more than happy to to take any uh, any comments or, or any, any questions. Thank you.
Great, thank you, Asir. Um, really interesting policy recommendations. Um, definitely, I think some suggest some opportunities for, for our governments and for future work by the ICCT. Um, so yeah, I'd like to now kind of open it up to all the, the panelists and uh, get some discussion going. And so I have some questions for different um, speakers, but I invite anyone to, to answer after the, the first answer. So I want to start with Rachel and go back to an issue that came up, which is really the awareness about these fantastic rebate programs. And you mentioned uh, you're working on a toolkit for community partners, but I was wondering if you have any details on how you're working with other stakeholders and what other stakeholders you think are important in spreading awareness about this policy, but also about the benefits and the challenges of use SEVs that we've heard about today. Great. Right. <clears throat> That's a great question, you know, and it's something that we definitely, you know, are trying to focus on as we sort of, um, can, you know, move forward with these new program changes. Um, I think one of the things that we have definitely identified is, you know, working really closely with community groups who are eligible to receive you know, the use of incentive. Um, so that means, you know, working closely with community-based organizations and leaders of the community to, you know, help just inform in general about um, EVs, about charging, and, you know, and about our program and the availability of the used EVs uh, for the rebate. Um, you know, we've definitely heard that um, it helps to work with trusted members of the community to really help um, spread the word and also just to ensure that we have a strong um, social media presence um, and other just sort of other platforms out there to help get the word out. Um, you know, part of the challenge that we saw over the past few years of the program is that just as we were starting to really ramp up, COVID hit. And so it just really curtailed our ability to be in the community. Um, so I think we're just hoping that moving forward, uh, we'll have some future opportunities, um, you know, and just trying to figure out how else to kind of work within um, this, you know, this sort of virtual landscape um, to kind of get out there. Great. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I wonder if, uh, uh, Sierra, if you have any thoughts from England about the other stakeholders you've talked to to try to uh, provide more information or who you think could be uh, important in filling that role. Um, so, again, as as I said in the presentation, we think it's um, it, the, the key here is obviously to try and work with uh, some sort of standardized information. Uh, and through standardizing it, across the market be an EV deal or such like, then that would be the best method. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so I also wanted to come back to Sky. I mean, you have a huge amount of data about the batteries and like you showed, that's probably the, the overwhelming concern for most vehicle buyers. But you also hinted that you were looking at some other ways to try to support the used uh, electric vehicle market um, and some of the other unique issues there. Any chance you could give us a preview or some ideas about uh, how a business like yours can support some of the other concerns? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Asir's, um, you know, bullet points of like, you know, what are the specs, what's the spec need to to include? I think it was um, a pretty good roadmap for us. Uh, one of the thing that's, one of the things that, that is a challenge um, is just characterizing uh, what features are present on a car. Um, when those features, it used to be that like if you had a VIN, you know, you could look up essentially the whole spec, like what what you know bundle of of um, hardware features was there. But now that that when new features can be unlocked on the car via software, um, the VIN can't. You know, like you know, you can after market you can sort of pay in some cases to unlock more battery capacity or um, pay for something like um, you know autopilot or you know what I'll put in giant air quotes full self drive um, which in that that can't be gleaned from a, a VIN lookup that's an industry standard thing so I think that's like an interesting one of like just besides you know the health of the battery like 
what are you actually getting if you buy this car and um, you know what features are you going to get and what software features have been unlocked you know and which which of those transfer to the next owner like um, th there's all kinds of things that are that are different um, that are you know I think there needs to be real transparency on the secondary market of like exactly what you're getting and the way that that's happening is different now yeah makes a lot of sense um, and I invite anyone any of the other panelists if anything uh, catches your attention to just jump into the discussion. And also for the audience, um, please send in any questions or uh, responses to anything you're hearing and we will ask those right away. Um, but I, I guess one other part of the picture that we haven't talked a lot about yet, but has come up in, a, in certainly our paper and um, in a few of the presentations is the charging infrastructure side. And uh that you know for used electric vehicles it's it's the same infrastructure but there's some different concerns based on the the types of drivers so i'm wondering if any of you uh have plans for uh or have or have thoughts on how governments or how other organizations can try to overcome the charging infrastructure hurdle specifically for used ZEV drivers I'll right. jump in so with think, a, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Rachel, please. Oh, sorry, no, I was going to say, yeah, I, you know, that's definitely, you know, a, an issue that we're trying to tackle here, um, because I think even though our survey data shows that most people are charging at home, you know, as we try and expand access um, to EVs to all um, populations of Oregon, you know, particularly the low and moderate income households, you know, they may not have at home charging. And so we want to figure out how can we make public charging more accessible to them? So does that mean, um, you know, making it uh, easier for if they live in a multi-unit dwelling uh, to make sort of permitting easier for the property owner to put in, um, you know, charging facilities? Does it mean like, you know, one of the things we've talked about is partnering with utilities um, to help them get like subscription you know free subscription access for some of the lower um, income households to get free charging for like a year or two at the public charging stations that are scattered throughout the city you know how else can we you know put in more charging stations you know we're looking at uh i know pge one of our utility companies um has been doing some pilot programs to do sort of pole charging um so that you know they don't have to worry about the siding of the actual charging station and, and things like that so, I mean, there's a lot of things that we're looking at here in Oregon to sort of increase the public charging capability so that, you know, the charging is not as much of a concern. But we recognize, you know, until you can get charging you know, out in the in the areas where many of our communities might live, um, it, you know, it can still be a barrier. I was just going to jump in. I, I I interrupted myself because I think Rachel was answering directly the question. I want to sort of like say something adjacent on this issue that just connects like the availability of charging to used car prices, and the like. I think because we're in this state where there's not kind of you know charging everywhere. It's not like gas stations. Like we're every new charger that gets deployed in an area like increases the utility of the cars that are in that area and so like that means like the value of those cars basically like in a, in a small way goes up a little bit and so there's you know, like if it's easier to charge and so there's this interesting sort of like impact that i think can happen to on used car prices and maybe there's an economic driver that like somebody like it's like well who gains from the value of of car of used cars increasing uh, like I, you, you can kind of answer that question, and then maybe that sort of points to a um, to sort of people that will help and and sort of be really supportive of uh, in a financial way on on getting more chargers out there in all different neighborhoods. So, so in the UK, we've got uh, we've had some legislation come in so that new houses and uh, and and workplaces and multi multi uh, dwellings do have to have charging facilities uh, provided. Uh, the um, uh, the idea is that uh, as you build a new property, as you're fit, fitting out a new office, then that facility that's done at the at the at the start, which is the easiest time to add charging. Uh, in terms of uh, how do we approach the used car market, where the the user may actually not have a driveway, may live in in a, an apartment 
or a flat uh, and their and their landlord doesn't want a charging um, a, a level two charger availability uh, and with that facility uh, we are working with councils we, we have actually with um with eva england we work with what's called an excess group and these are local enthusiasts and we also ask work with them and through our membership ask them to go to their member of parliament to their councillors and actually point out where they think that they need the charging because maybe one of the biggest problems for for councillors and for local councils and, and local authorities is um even if they have the funding they're not sure where where is the right place wh which demographic which location requires a charging so they need that kind of feedback so we're asking our members to try and provide that feedback and, and certainly to uh, make it uh, a key um, a key important uh, subject for that that is raised with their members of parliament as well uh, and so that's one way that we are we are trying to help uh, close the loop um, and uh, and of course it, the more charging posts that are available that are made and also made visible so the more visible they are the more people see them the more likely people will more more easily move to use evs um having a, a charging post at the back of um, a pub in the uk so uh, we, had, we had a lot of these at the back of pubs and car parks uh, where it's dark uh, every everybody who's who knew that they were there was fine and we have a lot of very good apps such as zap map uh, plug share as well is over here and and uh, what's up uh, but uh, fundamentally, if they're if we can make them in public places such as uh, supermarkets, sh uh, retail parks, and they're and they're visible, then people go, okay, well, there's a charger there. If I get an EV, I'm going to come here once a week to do my grocery shopping. I can plug in here. Yeah, definitely. So another side of the awareness is is making sure that people can find the charging and can use it easily and. I agree with the, the EV ready building codes as, as we typically call them are really critical and uh, it's a long range uh, time horizon, but will be a really important policy. Um, so we're almost at the end of the hour, but I wanted to end with one uh, lightning question in the spirit of, of the ZEV Alliance, always trying to find the most important areas for collaboration and new research. Uh, what would you say in, in like one or two sentences tops um, is a, an, an area where governments and other uh, stakeholders need to work together and do some more research to make the used market work better over the next uh, 10 years, let's say. So I'd like to hear from each of you very quickly. Let's see if I pick, I'll call on someone. Um, the standardization of, of, of the, uh, the the vehicle information. I mean, that's got to be key to, and then specifically the battery certificate. Because once you've got that in that process, that will make it easier for all the users. Great. Uh, maybe Rachel? Yeah. I was gonna say just to jump on that bandwagon, I agree, you know, sort of the battery certification and just I think sort of to just warranty um you know, sort of issues as well, just to kind of give the consumers that assurance. Definitely. Uh Alex, any ideas? Sorry, I was on I think for me one thing that could be very useful is see um the private sector uh, sharing more of their uh, data uh, to the pub uh, to the public, because that will kind of like enable much more research that will help understanding um, how we can you know support better the, the use that market. So this kind of like, yeah. All right, and Scott, last uh, last word goes to you. I'm gonna go with this here uh, with. Well, the, the a serious thing about like putting chargers where they're visible, I, and I would just want to add like I spent ten years doing energy efficiency and and sort of realized how um, how sort of irrational it was that people were like really excited about solar panels because they're visible um, before they were interested and ex and could get excited about attic insulation, which really by all rights should have been done first, but it's less visible, and so it's like 
you know, it's less viral basically. And so I think of the the charger at the back of the pub as like attic insulation and the charger that's like big and garish in the front as a solar panel. And I think that's what we're gonna need. It may or may not be the right place to put it if you sort of like did the transportation planning, but I think that's what was, was gonna really accelerate the market. All right, well, thank you all very much uh, for your insights there and throughout our webinar. And I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. So thank you again for uh, to our speakers. Thank you for everyone for attending. Um, as uh, we have written in the chat, we will share the slides and the recording from our webinar today on the Sub Alliance website. And uh, we also encourage you to check out our report that's published. We put the link in the chat and we'll send that out in the follow-up email as well for a lot more insights here. And with that, uh, have a great rest of your week and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Great, thanks.